This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners, and that's you right now. If you can hear me, you're listening, and you're a listener. Thanks to all of you, including Norm Fazekas, Chris Allen, Chris Smith, and Mountain Sloth. On this episode of DTNS, X tests charging a dollar a year to post. YouTube wants to make you watch better news. And what are those Activision Blizzard King games going to show up on Game Pass already? It's almost been a week. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 18th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Queso Diff, I'm Sarah Lane. Oh, well, this is no good. I'm just in Salt Lake City and I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, my friends, there is you no You could all like have us. Queso Diff. I mean, can we? I, can we? I, I, I think you are able to. Yep. Can we have your nice. case? my doctor. Yeah. I'll ask my doctor if queso I dip is right I only for me. want a couple and then I'm I'm done. So <laughs> listen, anyway. folks, there is no one else like us on the internet. We are funded by you. Nobody else. <laughs> when when you accuse us of being uh, beholden to corporate interests, you're just wrong. We're beholden to you. That's it. That's all we got. So thank you for supporting us. Let's start with the quick hits. Foxconn will partner with NVIDIA to build data centers specializing in data processing for autonomous cars and robots. Foxconn calls these data centers AI factories. They'll be built using NVIDIA's GH200 Grace Hopper superchips. Tesla has also been developing similar data centers that it calls Tesla Dojo, which uses NVIDIA's GPUs as well. Although Tesla has developed its own chips, it plans to use in Dojo in the future. Foxconn has been uh, moving into the autonomous car market for some time now, making control units and other parts and contracting to build EVs for company Fisker. Tuesday, we mentioned the new U.S. restrictions on exports of chips to China. Um, one of the things that happened in those new rules is NVIDIA's chips that they developed specifically to sell to China without violating the previous rules became restricted. Well, deep in the 400 pages of new rules, there are provisions that might help NVIDIA, as well as other chip makers like Intel and AMD, uh, to, so they can continue to sell some AI chips into China and be able to keep that revenue stream. The U.S. has asked for input on a tamper-proof way to prevent chips from being chained together to make a supercomputer while allowing AI use at smaller scales. If satisfied on these mitigations, then the U.S. might grant licenses so that NVIDIA and others could continue to sell some of their chips to China. The Wall Street Journal reports that Amazon is expanding the use of robotics in its warehouses. Project Sequoia includes updating sorting machines, robotic arms, and mover bots to speed up delivery fulfillment by 25% without replacing human workers. That is an interesting note. The first installation was launched this week in Houston, Texas, and Amazon Pharmacy has begun using Prime Air, Amazon's drone delivery service, to deliver medicines within 60 minutes of order in College Station, Texas, as well. Mm, Aggies. OpenAI has rolled out Browse with Bing to all the paying users, plus and enterprise subscribers, meaning those paying users of ChatGPT may now benefit from current information found on the web. Uh, previously, ChatGPT was limited to information from before September 2021. OpenAI also moved its image generator, Dolly 3, the latest version of Dolly, into beta on the web and mobile. Dolly 3 integrates with ChatGPT. It's all multimodal. Well, Roblox may one day be mm. the virtual world worthy of the term metaverse, but we're not exactly there quite yet. Its workers aren't going to work virtually as much anymore as well. Roblox's CEO wrote an email to workers on Tuesday saying the company is transitioning away from remote work. Staffers have until January 16th to decide if they want to stay with the company as it moves to a hybrid model of three days a week in the office or not. Employees who want to stay will be offered relocation pay if necessary. Workers who don't want to stay can continue to work until April 15th, at which time they will be offered severance packages. 
We have X news today, but it's not as bad as you think. X, uh, which if you're like, wait, what is X again? Uh, go to Twitter.com and you'll yeah, find yourself at X. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, X has begun testing a dollar per year charge. Uh, it's referred to as not a bot uh, for new users. So if you're an existing user, you don't have to pay, uh, but new users, and they're only testing it in New Zealand and the Philippines. So this is, let's try it out in a couple of smaller markets, see what we learn for, from it before we decide whether we're going to roll it out everywhere else. Those users can view posts, follow accounts for free, so you don't have to pay to look. But if you want to do anything else like post, repost, the old retweet, reply, bookmark, do a quote post, you got to pay the dollar a year subscription fee. Of course, you can also pay the $8 a month premium plan. That'll get you all of those rights as well, but you don't have to. X says the plan is meant to reduce spam, manipulation of our platform, and bot activity. So you uh, might have some questions. Uh, <laughs> some of the most popular uh, questions from the overall community of X include, okay, why is the $1 subscription per year only on the web, not the mobile app? That happens. Why is not a bot only being rolled out in two countries, New Zealand and the Philippines? Also, that kind of happens. But then some other questions like, is this some sort of easy way to get people's financial info? And another uh, popular question, is this legit spam, uh, uh, legit spam deterrent or more of like a pay a very small amount to be a bot? All right, let me run through these. Uh, why is it a dollar for new users? Uh, that's just good policy. When you when you add in a charge, uh, you you tend to grandfather in people beforehand, at least for a while. Uh, might not always be that way. We'll see how this test goes, but that that's typical because you're already, the other people aren't going to be dissuaded as much if they're already in the system, if they've already evaded the other anti-bot system. So it makes sense to apply it to new users. I get that. Uh, why only two countries? Because you're testing it. You want to pick two different countries, that's Philippines very and New common. Zealand. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's pretty common. New Zealand and Philippines are different demographics. So you get different kinds of information uh, from the two. Is it an easy way to get people's financial info? Well, yeah. So is paying anybody anywhere. <laughs> anybody who charges you gets your financial info. So uh, I don't think X is particularly nefarious in charging people. They already charge people for stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm not not too worried about that. The big one is, is this a legitimate spam deterrent? Um, as I said on TMS when, we, when I talked to Scott, Scott earlier today, if you're wondering, will this stop every bot from appearing on X, the answer will be no. There's, there's plenty of bots that will pay the fee, will figure out how to create different credit card numbers, get around financial restrictions and all that situation. It will happen. Will it reduce the number of bots and spam on, on X? Yes, it will, because there will be lots of them who won't want to go through that or are operating at such massive levels that it would be prohibitively expensive for them to do it. So uh, it... It is to me, I don't know, Scott, what do you think? It feels like a reasonable, if you take the personalities out of it, uh, way to test bot uh, combating. Yeah, I mean, all my all my biases left at the door for a minute. It seems like, I was trying to go through this in my head earlier, like if you have uh, somebody who's used to spamming the system with new signups at the, at the rate of, let's say, a thousand an hour, I don't even know what you could do. You could do more than that, I'm sure. But let's say you're doing that. Well, a lot of those get caught right away. Some of those uh, get caught later. But a percentage of those get through. And those thrive as bots or misinformation accounts or whatever they are intended to be. Those are just out there in the wild. And that is the goal. It's a percentage game, just like spam and other you know forms of that sort of thing. They're just trying to get as many through the gate as they can. And if uh, you get a few, then you're happy. Well, this makes it so those people would have to spend a thousand dollars an hour you know in theory to or pump year. that a much year. in there no, or whatever not, whatever yeah, wallet yeah. is they have to go over my point is like that will slow them down it may not sure, eliminate sure, it sure, entirely sure. but they're not gonna you know this isn't gonna be at the same rate it used to be if you're one of those big heavy number spammer accounts and it's not the only thing they're doing 
Uh, in right. fact, the director of engineering, Eric Ferraro, uh, said they're exploring using phone ver verification, ID verification, and there are other strategies, uh, heuristics and models to detect fake accounts and all that. So the bigger question is charging somebody for something that used to be free usually drives people away from that platform. You can overcome it if you're a very popular and compelling platform. Is X still that? Well, that is a big question, Ooh, right? Yeah, that yeah. is a big I, one. That's where I have to go back to the door and pick up my bias bag that I set over there and pull out <laughs> my biases. But I, I think that it is riskier now. I don't think that's what even a crazy thing to say, bias right? Bag? <laughs> I got so many things in my bias bag, Sarah, I couldn't even begin to start. <laughs> but it but it feels like if you if you if you're a normal thinking person, whatever that even means, don't ask me to define it. But if you're watching what's happening over on X slash Twitter. It's impossible to see it as going great. And so therefore, it does seem more risky to do this at a time where people are already kind of on the edge of leaving. I know a lot of people say they're going to, but they don't. So, you know, maybe they're planning on that being the, the, the bigger part of this. Then people just won't leave. But to me, it seems like a way to weaken the platform during a time where it's already a little bit weak. Yeah. And honestly, that's why you do a test in smaller markets to yep. just to test that effect. So this is this is the company acting like a, a reasonable company to try something out. And I, I'll point out, a lot of people pointed this out too. WhatsApp used to charge 99 cents to mm -hmm. become a WhatsApp user. So it's not like this hasn't even been done before. WhatsApp doesn't do that anymore. Did they find that it wasn't effective or is it just because Meta owns WhatsApp now and wanted to have other ways of, of, of doing it? I don't know. Yeah. Well, moving on to YouTube, which Scott, I know you uh, you have a lot of uh, 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 you you've been hanging out on YouTube more than you had in the past. Uh, it announced changes to its interface and creator tools that will roll out over the next few weeks. Some of those include the watch page now recommending more news videos that YouTube considers credible. Creators now being able to add timestamps to their videos when they show products that will surface shopping buttons, for example, to buy those products in the video. Um, you know, maybe putting news aside for a second, Scott, you're using YouTube more than ever. Um, is Are these changes uh, going to make you better connect with your own community? Well, I think it's possible. Like a lot of the changes are ad based changes and i think they're good ones for example a lot of creators on youtube will do special arrangements with advertisers and say you know this episode or whatever uh was brought to you by squarespace or something and then they go on for a while and talk about squarespace they throw up some graphics normal ad behavior on a on a on a show or a video like that what one of the things they're going to allow them to do moving forward is to timestamp that stuff specifically and add interactivity to it. So for example, instead of you just saying, hey, go to Squarespace and use a code and whatever, and it's all very superfluous, they will throw up a time-stamped actual interactable button that will let people go right then to the place they need to go to activate whatever code needs to be activated or whatever URL they're trying to go to. It will be part of you know, the video. It's integrated into the video at the time you want it to be integrated in there. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty massive thing for people that are that are doing promotional deals even outside of the normal YouTube uh, ad system. But then you can also do the, a lot of that with the with the built-in ad system. Some of this is only going to be relevant to people with you know big audiences uh, currently, but I could see that being a really big deal to creators. Um, with that will come some better visibility, uh, more usability, and some of this stuff is going to be available via the app itself. They also talked a lot about how uh, shorts are sort of exploding over there um, as part of their news thing as well. Yeah, they're paying to people to, to create news shorts. Sadly, not a lot of people, like 40 organizations around the world, maybe. Yeah, unless, it's, maybe it's small, <laughs> small. Yeah. But what they're, I think it, it does say, or it does go to what they're saying, which is, we're trying to create some curation around these because to be honest, you can go to YouTube right now, do a simple search across the site, which includes shorts and regular long form videos. And you are going to get a lot of, of comeback on the search of stuff you've never heard of from everybody from a dude in his basement all the way up to CNN or somebody, you know, of, of note. And it's just kind of a mess. And at a time where X and even meta 
are hesitant to do too much to promote news, quote unquote news, which often has politics surrounding it. It's interesting to see YouTube or see YouTube say, well, what if we did, what if we leaned into it? People are there yep. searching for it anyway. Why don't we make kind of almost like a Google News solution in video? Google News is great at this. It's like, here's the headline you looked for or clicked on. And also, everybody everybody gets paid in this situation, unlike Google right. News. <laughs> right. That's the other point. Like you are, you, people are getting paid. But the curation's nice because it's like, all right, here's the main article. Here are four other versions of it of reputable sources. And then below that are a bunch more. And then below that are maybe some extras or some video or whatever. This is them saying, all right, Google News in video format. And the side note is, you know, yeah. some people are going to get paid for this. I think on paper, this sounds great. I think as a creator, practice, I hate it because I'm not one of the limited number of credible sources. Uh, yeah. But as a user, I understand that you want to set that barrier way inside the fences to make sure you're not accidentally putting your stamp of approval on something bad. So right. maybe it's maybe it's good in that respect. Yeah, I'm excited to see how it goes. Well, folks, uh, yeah, you got a thought about this? I bet you do. Uh, don't just keep it to yourself. Share it with us. Email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Xbox and head of Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer confirmed Wednesday in an official Xbox post that Activision Blizzard games won't be coming to Xbox Game Pass until at least 2024. Yeah, if this sounds familiar to you, Activision Blizzard did post on X before Microsoft closed its deal that Modern Warfare 3, Diablo 4 would not come to Xbox Game Pass this year. Sort of implied that most of their stuff probably wouldn't come this year, but left the door open if you're hopeful that maybe some of the older titles might. Uh, so Spencer added... This acquisition is definitely long-term. So the fact that we're not hitting day one with a bunch of games dropping into Game Pass is a little bit of a downer, but I'm very excited about the future and I just want to be straight with people. That, that, that is where we are. He also blamed regulatory. He was like, the regulatory process was so complicated. It just didn't give us a chance to do the work to bring them into Game Pass and we're starting that work now. Uh, Scott, do you buy it? I do. Um, I think there's a lot involved with that. I also think unlike their acquisition of Bethesda, where Bethesda had their own launcher, but it was still sort of fresh and nobody was using it. It was kind of a failed attempt, which a lot of launchers are, to be honest. The only real successful launcher on PCs are, uh, to the greater degree, Steam. And then you could say Blizzard's own Battle.net maybe gets in a close second, given the quality of their titles. But for the most part, launchers for EA and Ubisoft and everybody else and their dog has not been a great experience. So that was an easier shutdown and move everything over kind of experience, I think, for them. Um, but I think what got people asking the question now and why they're feeling disappointed that the answer isn't this year is they seem to be hurrying up in some other ways. They put out that video. The video indicates a ton of Blizzard content uh, and Activision content are coming to Game Pass. That's the promise of the video. And that includes the titles we've talked about, plus more. They didn't they even showed World of Warcraft, which tells me that thing's coming to Game Pass in what form or how you pay for it. I don't know yet. But the point is they've said as much there. And then they also kind of rushed, I wouldn't say rushed, they surprised everybody yesterday with Diablo 4 showing up on Steam. Ah, and Steam is okay. just another place to pay for it and buy yep. it. But the fact that that happened so quickly, I think a lot of people are like, oh, does this mean we're, are we moving? Are we shaking? And then they started asking him all these questions. And he's like, yeah, that's still kind of an issue. And and I understand why it is. the The movement of this stuff, uh, two game pass is going to be tricky. You're talking about a lot of cross saves already out in the cloud. They got to have some integration plans. Like, are you going to let Diablo four people on on uh, uh, on Battle.net rather be able to migrate their saves and their accounts and their profiles? All that stuff is that going to be a simple process over to Game Pass? Are you even going to allow that? Like, there's a lot of questions. And with the streaming stuff being complicated, where Ubisoft has the rights outside of Europe and right. Microsoft just has to provide fair terms within Europe. That complicates a lot of backend stuff, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of this is as easy as people want to make it seem. You know, that even that video of them celebrating that they got the deal through, that sat on somebody's hard drive for probably months. And because they didn't know when this thing was going to finally get done, but they wanted to be ready. So some of what you're seeing is them going, ta-da, oh, we not, were ready. Not the video of them like cheering in their office. You mean the video they cut together of all the games? Correct. That, yeah, that, yeah, that, that very sense. curated video right. uh, was was awesome. I really liked it. 
but it was obvious to me that they've been holding on that and pulling, getting ready to pull that trigger for as long as they've been trying to finish out the deal. Now that the deal's over, they can pull the trigger on that. They pulled the trigger on getting Steam and Diablo 4 happening. Prior to this, they already got Overwatch 2 over there to a lot of chagrin, but it's but it's there. So these are now two Blizzard mainstream titles. Yeah, yeah. And they're also the two newest Blizzard games, I should mention. Um, whether or not, you, you mentioned older games, so whether or not Heroes of the Storm, StarCraft II, mm-hmm. uh, World of Warcraft for that matter, and even some other older games than that, whether those get over sooner, it's arguable. They could probably easily move Blizzard Arcade over there, which is a collection of classic games from the Super Nintendo and the Arcade uh, when Blizzard was a very young company. Those exist, and those are on Battle.net. Very easy to move that stuff uh, over there. But some of this bigger stuff, it's going to take a little time. And the, and the other Activision stuff we haven't mentioned, too. There's a huge catalog there that's not Blizzard. even. Oh, gigantic. Yeah, I'm focusing so much on Blizzard here, but there's yeah, a yeah. huge bunch of, of, of what's happening over on on the Activision side, including titles people think are dead and 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 Microsoft's interested in bringing back. You keep he- hearing uh, Phil Spencer bring up the fact that Hexen is one of his favorite video games ever. It was originally Hexen. built on yeah, the Doom yeah. engines, old as dirt. But he loved it. I loved it. So I'm all for, for this idea. He keeps wearing T-shirts at events that say Hexen. I think it's clear <laughs> Microsoft's going to make a new Hexen game. But it's we want it all now, and it's going to take time. So... Uh, next year's not that crazy. Yeah, and and the Steam stuff was already in the hopper, right? That right. that was independent of Microsoft acquiring them. That, yeah, it that's just good. ended up feeling. Anyway. Yeah, it just yeah, had yeah. A kind of a in inoper- not in opportune timing, but timing. But interesting to it. timing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and 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 honestly, we we on our show on Core, we didn't know what would be next. We have a whole bet going about which games would make it to Steam first or to Game Pass next or all that. Um, I think my co-host John wins because he said Steam and Diablo Four, which happened way sooner than we expected. Um, so I, I do think it does do them a favor though, by showing hustle after the fact. And even if some of it was already in the hopper, it feels like, all right, we're on it. Boom, boom, boom. And that's what, I think that's what gamers want to hear. So they can have this kind of confidence in this, in this transaction that they know these games are being taken care of. They're very quickly being shuttled in front of them. Like there's a lot of this, I think that can be taken positively, at least by the Microsoft crowd. Yeah. Uh, slightly related, uh, Boom 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 is one of the lines in Eve Psyche and the Bluebeard's Wife by La Seraphim, who are going to be performing at BlizzCon November 4th after the community event. So I decided I'm going to go to BlizzCon to see La Seraphim. Uh, and it doesn't seem like anyone else is going. I, I keep asking, yeah. like, hey, are you going to be at BlizzCon? People are like, oh, I wish I could. I'm not going to be there. So I, I'm both concerned and I'm and excited for you because on the one hand, you got tickets. On the other hand, you shouldn't be able to still get tickets. It's yeah, weird. I know. That was a lot. Yeah. And I got them on the secondary market for lower than face value. Yeah. yeah. Well, y'all, um, if you if you uh, experience leaf blowing in your life and think, wow, it's really loud. I wish this didn't happen. I've got good news. The early morning calm is going to come back in style. If you get it, you get it. Whisper Technologies announced the Whisper Drive, an add-on for leaf blowers that reduces noise. Whisper claims it makes leaf blowers up to 40 times quieter at 50 feet away. The company also plans to partner with existing leaf blowers makers to integrate its device and hopes to have partnerships by the end of the year and leaf blowers on the market using its technology by 2025, if not sooner. Yeah, this is a, an aerospace company. They're they're making like military uh, products. Uh, they're making drones. Uh, they're making consumer product drones as well. And this particular leaf blower technology came from a drone fan that they realized was really quiet and pushed enough air to move leaves around. So they're like, maybe we should make a leaf blower. Everybody wants quieter leaf blower, and and uh, and they have. And I. I want this, and if 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 and when it comes out, if it's uh you know reasonably priced, I'm I may buy it because <laughs> because man, do I hate the sound of a leaf blower? Uh, but oh I do like to get the leaves out. My dogs is, want it, me to get this. My dogs would like yes. to request that I buy this. Yeah, they hate our leaf blower. Hate it. Yeah, uh, for anybody who's like leaf blowers, what what's the deal? <laughs> you know, if you're in a suburban atmosphere where you know 
you got to do something with your leaves. Uh, leaf blowers are, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of life. If you're in a rural area, they also might be, but maybe yeah. aren't, you know, right outside your bedroom window type thing. So, and, yes. Uh, Royal Hoser asked a very pertinent question. Does it make the engine on the leaf blower quieter? Yes, it's electric. Oh, it's not a gas yeah. blower. That's right. So it's a very it's a it's a very quiet engine as well. The whole yeah. the whole thing is like like you said, forty times quieter at 50, 50 feet away. Nice. Yeah, we I ended up it. with a uh, electric or no, yeah, a chargeable electric leaf blower with replaceable batteries. And I am telling you now, even though it's still loud, that is the greatest innovation ever. I can't wait till everything is just I can plug it in. It's yes, great. resin. I meant motor. Whatever. Yeah, My, Tom uh, always means motor. Just assume it. Yeah, even when I said BlizzCon earlier, I meant motor. <laughs> he meant motor. Yeah, okay. uh, think about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm currently hanging out in a in a uh, lifestyle with a wireless vacuum cleaner. Ooh. Boy, boy, has that changed some things. So Goodness. this is, I feel like it's just, you know, let's just get to the next version of what we all need to do. Um, that is, you know, the least horrific. I'll buy, I'll thing. buy this for people on my block just to keep them from making noise. In my right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's check out the mailbag. <sighs> Let's do it. This one comes from Colin on Apple Lock-In and the whole green bubble issue. Colin says, it isn't just about RCS support. Apple has made or allowed a series of decisions that may communicate with the Android from iOS inconvenient and makes leaving iOS painful. Somehow, after four years on Android, I'll still meet new iPhone users who can text me because the first message gets sent to me as an IM message, gets goes into a black hole. My phone number has been unregistered from iMessage for years. I've spent hours on the phone with Apple support. But the attitude is, oh, that's weird. Oh, well, from Apple. Between making iPhones unable to text former users reliably, preventing adding SMS numbers to existing me iMessage groups, not changing existing threads from iMessage to SMS when the number is removed from iMessage and not supporting RCS, they really make it difficult for iOS users to communicate with the Android users. I don't think Colin's experience is widespread, but that I, I, I understand if that's going on, that it's particularly frustrating. So uh, we, we feel for you, Colin. We do. Um, and thanks for writing in. Anybody who has uh, thoughts and <laughs> thoughts and prayers for our shows, uh, do send them to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Scott Johnson, always a pleasure to have you here. Let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. Well, um, just as it so happens, the news that Microsoft finally got the deal through, which would have been huge news for us in our show called Core at frogpants.com slash core, would have been a really great thing to happen last Thursday. Sadly, it happened early Friday and we missed the window. So we are expecting to talk a lot about what that means, what it is right now, what it could be by next year and so forth. So if you would like to hear our breakdown and rundown of all of that, plus all the great games that are coming out, we got Spider-Man this week, a brand new Mario game that is getting like rave reviews. Uh, it's a really good show for that stuff. So check it out. That's frogpants.com slash core or find core wherever you get your podcasts anywhere around the world indeed 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 and by around the world scott means motor yeah, uh patrons stick around for the extended show good day internet today we are tackling the subject of freedom on the internet actually it's a really really good column on technology review uh about whether it's possible to vibe shift social networks. If, if you enjoyed our conversation about Mark Andreessen's manifesto yesterday, uh, this is a very different point of view from a very different person. So stick around patrons for that. Just a reminder, we do the show live and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Nika Monfort joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>